Hi everybody, just to let you know we're going to start in about two minutes, okay? We're going to start taking your places.
this one. Because what's wrong? That's okay. Translation 
uh, available as well. So if you would like the translator headphones, just uh, you know, ask for that and we'll get you that as well. Uh, the other thing that I want to let you know is we are broadcasting via Facebook as well. So hi Facebook, hi. how are you? We don't want to forget, so, our, so I remind our speakers to play the room and play the Facebook. <laughs> so we don't want to leave them out. Uh, so with that, I would like to go ahead, and I think we can go ahead and get started. We've had quite a day today, quite a program. It's very exciting. So I'd like to ask for Julio Carvalho, if you would come up and do the opening for us, we will uh, go ahead and get started with that. Supreme Intelligence of the Universe, we ask to send your highly evolved servants, our spiritual benefactors, and encourage each individual who came here today, and all of those who the sound waves of our voices today my reach to give them the wisdom that they need to empower themselves and overcome life's challenges and all of those who are on the other side of life who made the biggest mistake of their lives by destroying their biological vehicle we ask that they receive our vibrations of love and tenderness so they can rehabilitate themselves as best as possible and restart again their journey of growth. We ask you to bless each speaker so they can convey the message that we all need to hear in order to overcome our own imperfections, our own flaws, and definitely become a better version of ourselves. So, Thank you, Julio. And we will look forward to hearing from you later. Indeed. All right, so uh, without any further delay, I would like to go ahead and introduce uh, our first uh, uh, song. We're going to hear from, full disclosure, my goddaughter, Emily Cornwell, who I've known well since she was a little tyke. Um, so Emily, why don't you come on up? We're going to ask you to please stand for the national anthem.
So normally what I do is I, I uh, will, I have a bio and I'll read off the bio and you know, that'll be very boring, but we decided to do something a little bit different this year. I'm gonna talk to Via for a couple of minutes before you start, right? So I think we have, so Via, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I'm actually a junior here at Stony Brook University. Um, this is my campus. Um, and I have, in terms of spiritism, I've grown, in, grown up in spiritism since the age of three. And I continue to um, study spiritism. I have I host Cardiac Radio for Teens for the past three years, in which I um, talk about spiritist topics for topics for um, teenagers to understand and to apply to their daily lives, and hopefully help with all the problems that they face as we um, know they go through today. Yeah. So you've got your uh, about you know the absolutely the right age range to be kind of speaking to the whole theme about this today. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a lot to say. Um, yeah, it's definitely something, I'm 20 years old, and it's definitely something you see more and more these days, yeah. and also in the younger generations, it's just becoming more talked about, and more known, and happening more often, so it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. Great, well, uh, thank you for that. Let's uh, go ahead and let you get into your presentation and see what you have uh, to show us. So, I'm going to start off today by talking about what is Spiritism, um, because as you know, this is a Spiritist event, and I want to make sure that um, for those who don't know Spiritism, we can understand Spiritism and understand how it can help us in our difficult times. So, I first want to talk about how Spiritism came to be, right? Where, where did it start? So, um, Hippoly Leon Denizar Revile. Um, who took on the name Alan Kardec when working um, on the Spiritist books and um, the Doctrine. He, um, he will start in 1854. Um, he heard about the phenomena of the turning tables for the first time. And so at this point, as you see, he was born in 1804. He was already 50 years old when he first started to hear anything about some type of spirit communication. So um, he wasn't born into it. it. He was already 50 when he started to get this knowledge. And in 1854, he heard about the turning tables. So this was a phenomena in which um, people would put their hands on a three-legged table and speak to the table and wait for the table to move or to respond or to do something. And they didn't know why it was happening. And it was just a form of entertainment. That's just something that they did, like going to the movies um, or doing something fun, they would do that. And they didn't really question it. So in 1854, that's when he first experienced this just as a form of entertainment. In 1855, um, Kardec spoke with his friend, um, Mr. Carlotti, about the turning tables. Mr. Carlotti was the first to tell Kardec about the communication with the spirits. Kardec, however, was not convinced, and instead, his doubts increased. So, after observing these turning tables, his friend of 25 years, so like his best friend, his closest friend, told him how um, there was more to these tables, how there was this communication with the spirits. But he still didn't believe it, right? So he didn't just um, just believe it and start making the books right away. He had so many doubts about how that could be possible. So in May of 1855, Kardec went to visit the medium, Miss Rogers, at her house with Mr. Fortier, um, who he originally went to the turning tables with. There he met Miss Pettier and Miss Plainmason, Plain and they confirmed what Mr. Kalati had said earlier that year. So, of course, it wasn't that he was just distrusting what his friend was saying, but he needed more exposure to it. He needed to see why. He needed to hear other people's um, explanations. So um, they were kind of able to to make it click in his head those things that Mr. Kalati was introducing. So with his exp explanation, Kardec became more interested in the topic. Um, he, Mr. Pattier invited Kardec to observe meetings at Miss 
play Mason's house, and Cardiff accepted. So again, he's not a spiritist at this point, which we'll see um, the definition of later. Um, he's not even believing in this communication with the spirits, but he's just interested. He's intrigued and he wants to find out more. At Miss Playmation's house, Cardiff observed the phenomena of the turning table. So once again, he saw this, this turning table happening, but now in a medium setting where they were talking about the interactions with, um, with the spirits. Again, not immediately convinced, but he noticed that there had to be something behind this table, right? The table couldn't just be moving for no reason. So again, still not convinced, but knowing that there had to be something, whether it was something um, scientific or maybe something spiritual like they were saying. At one of these meetings, um, Kardec met Mr. Bodden, who invited him to attend more meetings at his house. And Kardec accepted and started to go there frequently. So again, he started going to more of these, um, these meetings, seeing more of these, observing them to kind of get a better understanding of all these ideas, these new ideas that were coming to him. And then a few years later, in 1857, the Spirit's Book was published. Um, so this was 501 questions from Alan Kardec and so he asked the questions and the spirits responded. So in that time, spiritism clicked for him. He started to see that, okay, there was this connection with the spirits. It was the spirits having this, um, this effect on the turning tables and in this meetings and all those teachings that his friends had been telling him and his acquaintances had been telling him for so long was finally clicking. And in that um, time, from those two years, he um, published the spirits book. Under the name Alan Kardec, which as we saw, his name was Hibali Leon Denizar Rabayo, but he changed, um, like a pen name, he changed it to Alan Kardec so that his professional work as a, um, as a teacher would not be mixed, um, and his writings as a teacher would not be mixed with the writing of the spirits. Um, so the way that the spirits book is formatted is that Alan Kardec asked these questions. And this um, superior spirits answered these questions. So the book is not Alan Kardec's ideas. It was his questions and the spirits who answered, and he um, wrote them down, annotated them. And along with his own personal comments, but in the book there's um, different fonts, so you can tell when it was the spirits answering or when it's just Kardec's um, personal comment to better explain that. In March of 1860, uh, the Spirits Book second edition was published, and this now had 1,019 questions. And this version of the Spirits Book is the one that we're still using today, the one, um, the one that we still study today in um, different updated translations and versions because, um, as we spoke about, Alan Kardec was in France, so all these all this teaching that was happening, these books he was writing, was in French. Um, so now we have English translations of them, and um, we know there's many um, Portuguese translations of them. And as we go get new versions of the translation, but the basic concepts are still these original ones from 1860. In 1861, um, he published the Medium's book, which we'll see the importance of later. In 1864, the Gospel According to Spiritism. In August of 1865, Heaven and Hell. And in January of 1868, Genesis. So these five books that we see here, are the main five books um, that he wrote that focus on the key topics of spiritism. So they established this basis of spiritism. And since, and we'll see that Alan Kardec himself um, published many more books, but there also have been other mediums who have um, not written the books themselves, but had um, tra transferred what the spirits were um, thinking and the spirits ideas to the paper for us. 
and we found many more. So there are thousands of other books that um, complement this and put um, supplementary evidence and context for us to understand. But these are the five main books that show the basis of spiritism and create that foundation. So other books that he um, published during this time that were not in these five main um, principal books is What is Spiritism in 1859 and Spiritism in its Simplest Form and Spiritist Trip in 1862. Um, these books I do not believe have been translated into English yet, um, only in Portuguese. And then, throughout this whole time that he's been working on all these books, um, and pretty thick books too, so there was a lot of content in, content in each and every one of them, um, through all this time he was also um, writing the Spiritist Magazine, or also known as the Spiritist Review. And um, again, just giving more, um, more information about Spiritism um, and everything that he was learning and acquiring. And just um, a side note that all of this information was taken from the book Obras Postumas that still hasn't been um, translated into English yet. So then um, I wanted to start with a piece from the Spirits book. So the introduction of the Spirits book. And so there's a couple pages of titles and um, of indexes, of intros, but then we get to the introduction. And oftentimes people want to skip the introduction of the book because they think, oh no, that's boring, I'm going to skip it. And this introduction is 46 pages of the book, so it's easy to think you want to skip it, but there's actually really important information um, for us to read. So it starts off with, when new matter arises, new words are needed for the sake of clarity of language in order to avoid the confusion inherited in multiple meanings for the same terms. So here they're saying, when new matters arise, such as spiritism, we need to create new words. We need to have something else because how are we going to have this thing that doesn't have a word, right? This thing that we're describing um, that has this meaning, but there's no word associated with it. And then it continues. The words spirit, Spiritual, spiritualist, and spiritualism each have a well-defined meaning. To give each of them a new meaning in order to apply it to the spiritist doctrine would be to multiply the already numerous causes of ambiguity. So here he's, um, the spirit are saying in the introduction that these words that people might want to use, spiritual, spiritualist, these are words that already exist and they already have their own meanings, their own definitions. So if we use those words for spiritism, we would be, um, we would be expressing two completely different concepts concept with the same um, word. Um, and I have a simple example of why this can be a problem. When you think of we saw her duck, there's two things that people might think of. You might think of her duck, she might have a pet duck, or you might think of her ducking down. So she could have ducked down, or she could have an actual duck. So something like that, having the same word, might not seem like a big deal, but it can mean very, very different things. So that's why the, spirit, the um, spirits are stressing the importance of having a new word. Strictly speaking, spiritualism is the opposite of materialism. So going back to that word that we originally had, spiritualism, that is the opposite of materialism. So you're not focusing on, um, on material things, right? You're focusing on spiritual concepts, but that doesn't mean you're focusing on spirits of themselves or the communication with spirits, just something other than, than matter. Everyone who believes there is something within them that is more than matter are spiritualists. So spiritualist is um, a broad category. It can encompass a lot of different types of people. People might have 
their own concepts of what's outside of matter, but if they believe in something outside of matter, then they are spiritualists. <clears throat> However, like we said, it doesn't necessarily follow that they must therefore believe in the existence of spirits or the communication with the invisible world. So just because they believe in something outside of matter, outside of the world that we physically see and touch, that doesn't mean that they believe in spirits, right? We can't assume what that means they believe in beyond uh, matter. So then they said, therefore, instead of the word, words spiritual and spiritualism, for designating this latter belief, we have coined and employed the words spiritist and spiritism. These are two, reflect, two terms reflecting their origin and their fundamental meaning, and they thus have the advantage of being perfectly understandable. We will leave spiritualism to its own meaning. So right here in the beginning of the Spirits book, which is why it's so important to read the introduction, they define this word, they make this word, spirit, spiritism for the doctrine of the spirit, and um, spiritist, right, for those who are following it. The spiritist doctrine, or spiritism, is based on the relationship between the material world and the invisible world, the latter being inhabited, inhabited by beings known as spirits. So right there, they're giving the word that, um, that, that they want to use, and they're giving the definition. So the spiritist doctrine is past spiritualist, right? It's a, with that relationship between the invisible world and the material world. And those of the invisible world are being known as spirits. So they're defining it right here, so we have a clear definition of what spiritism is. The adherents of spiritism will be called spiritists. So that's all of us that are studying spiritism will be called spiritists. So now I wanted to go back to what does the spiritist doctrine contain? What's in, spirit, um, in spiritism? So the spirits book, the first book that we saw that Kardec published, encompasses four different, um, four different main parts. And these main parts get um, further explained in the books that we saw that make up the five um, principal books. So we see that um, so the Spirit's Book explains first causes, which we'll go more in, uh, into, the spirit world, moral laws, and hopes and consolations. And so with this brief introduction on each of these four topics, um, the later book that he wrote, um, so the Genesis, relates, further explains these first causes while the spirit world is further explained and elaborated in the book, um, in the medium of the book. Moral laws are explained in the Gospel of Spiritism, which is the book that um, at Product Reading for Teens right now, um, online we're studying um, the, spirit, the Gospel According to Spiritism, and seeing those messages and seeing how they can apply to our daily lives is really important and is an easy way for us to um, put those moral laws that we're teaching into our daily lives. And hopes and consolations are further explained and elaborated in the book Heaven and Hell. And if, as you can see, um, these books were not written in the exact order, so he didn't go in order of um, the Genesis, the Mediums book. It's not the same order as they were published, um, but they all elaborate these main parts in the Spirit's book. So now to dive into some of those, um, the, into like the parts, and just to give a little brief explanation of what's mentioned in each of them. So the first part, which is the first causes, talks about um, the relationship between God, spirit, and matter. And with that, it talks about the universal cosmic fluid, which um, we can read more about to find. Um, it's complicated, but in basic terms, it's what makes up everything, right? So that um, the universal fluid is what's making up all of that, making up that matter and the spirit. And they go into much detail of, um, of that. And the, the main um, categories that they touch on in the spirit's book 
are talking about God, um, the general elements of the universe, creation, and vital principle. So here, uh, the second part, or the second book in that we saw, the medium's book, is the spirit world. So here we're talking about the interaction of the spirits in the material world and in the spiritual world, and their passage, right, from how we, um, we, when we pass away from this corporeal body and transition to the spirit world, or when we are in the spirit world and we um, reincarnate um, back into the material world. Um, so this, this part of the book, um, with the um, medium's book, talks a lot about that transaction between the spiritual world and the material. The third part, um, which specifically can help us, I believe, with um, this topic that we're talking about today, is these moral laws, right? How are we facing these things that happen in our everyday lives? Because someone may say, okay, I don't really want to know about the scientific stuff, or I don't really want to know about this um, interaction, but the moral laws are stuff that we can apply to our day-to-day -day lives to make them better, to help us through our hardships. So, here in the third part, um, the moral laws, we, and in the gospel according to spiritism, we learn about um, moral laws such as labor, um, society, justice, destruction, liberty, equality, reproduction, progress, and many, many other topics. And um, it gives an explanation on each of them on why why we should do that, why we shouldn't do that, what are the consequences from doing um, those, those things. Um, and these are the laws, right, that we should follow and would help us better our lives if we were able to follow those laws. And of course we know that we're not all perfect, so we make mistakes and we don't follow them, but our goal is to follow this path. Um, and if we follow these laws and we follow this path, hopefully it will lead us to um, a better future. And the last part, the fourth part, or, um, or the book Heaven and Hell, talks about how these, um, talks about focusing consolation, right? So how, what we're doing on earth and in our future, right, in the spirit world, of the joys and sorrows that we, that we have, both on earth, both um, in the spiritual world, and the consequences of fulfilling the laws. So the laws that we talked about, when we, when we do them, what's going to happen, right? What joys are going to come from that? When we aren't able to follow those laws, what are going to be the consequences? And learning about those com consequences may help us to understand why we're going through um, the struggles that we're going through, the difficulties that we're going through. Um, so that was a really quick summary of what um, spiritism is. But I also wanted to bring some examples of how spiritist topics can be... Um, put into simple messages that maybe just reading that one message a day can help you get through the day, can help you um, reflect on that throughout your day and um, brighten your day. So um, in this small book um, by um, Chico Xavier, um, Francisco Condido Xavier, um, he has a bunch of small um, small passages, small quotes that you can read um, in a quick five minutes, ten minutes, and there's many of these books that have positive messages that we can learn from. So I just pulled a few of those um, today so for us to talk about. The Golden Moment. When difficulties multiply around you, causing you embarrassment and struggle. When the vicissitudes appear to be so unbearable that abandoning your obligations may be the only way out. Then, and only then, you, will you have reached the golden moment to give testimony to your faith. Because serving and acting upon facing fatigue and tribulations, you can be assured that due to your work and dedication, God will come to your aid, and, in, and the unanticipated assistance and the unexpected light. So here, right, it's showing us how we're going to face those Challenges, and we might have a hard day. We might be having a hard week. We might be struggling through whatever it is we're struggling through. But they're saying once we're at that point of it seems so unbearable, 
that's the part that we know, right? That golden moment that we know that we just have to do the best we can and God will take care of the rest. So yes, it might feel unbearable, it might feel horrible, but um, if we just do our best, if we're following our laws and we're trying to push through all those things um, that we're facing, God will help us, right? And we'll have that um, assistance and life as it's their day. And this one's titled, And Life Goes On. Death to me see, means a change of re residence without loss of individuality. Because life goes on, carrying with it all that we have within ourselves, be it good or the absence of good. We will pass to the other life with that which, which we've gained ourselves. So again, here is summing up a really key um, aspect of spiritism that is important for us to all remember, and especially with this topic of um, suicide pre and prevention, that um, right with spiritual, those things that we do are carried with us um, afterwards. So even after we get rid of this corporeal body, everything that was good and everything that was bad is going to follow with us, and it's still going to be with us. So, right, it's just a change of residence. It's just like you're changing your house, you're changing your clothes. You're not changing what's inside. So um, that's also really important to, um, to realize because we think that sometimes that we might have an escape, right? We might have found something that will help us escape from all this. But in reality, that's always going to be there. So what we should try and do instead is to find those ways to um, to to follow those moral laws, to do those good things, to be our best, so that when we pass to the spiritual world, we'll have those good things with us, and hopefully um, not as many bad things with us. Impact your day just by thinking about this and trying to implement this into your day-to-day um, -day life. May God not permit me to lose my romantics, though knowing that roses do not speak. That I do not lose my optimism, though knowing that the future that awaits us is not a happy one. That I do not lose my will to live, though knowing that life is, in many moments, painful. That I do not lose my interest in making good friends, though knowing that, as the world turns, they wind up departing from our lives. That I do not lose the will to help people, though knowing that many of them are unable to see, to recognize, and to return this help. That I do not lose my equilibrium, knowing that countless forces desire my downfall. That I do not lose the will to love, though knowing that the person I love best may not share the same feelings for me. That I do not lose the light and the brilliance of my eyes, though knowing that many things that I will see in the world will darken my vision. That I do not lose my enthusiasm, though knowing that defeat and loss are two extremely dangerous adversaries. That I do not lose my reasoning though knowing the temptations of life are countless and delightful. That I do not lose the sense of justice, though knowing that, one harmed could, that the one harmed could be me. That I do not lose the strength of my embrace, though aware that one day my arms will be weak. That I do not lose the beauty and the happiness of sight, though knowing that a lot of tears will drop from my eyes and flow from my soul. That I do not lose the love for family, though knowing that many times it would demand incredible efforts on my part to maintain its harmony. That I do not lose the will of giving this tremendous love that exists in my heart, though subject that often it will be, sub it will be subjected and even rejected. That I do not lose the will to be great, though knowing that the world is small. And above all, that I never forget that God loves me infinitely, 
that a small grain of happiness and hope within each of each one can change and transform anything because life is constructed in our dreams and is summed up in love. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mia. Thanks for setting the stage for the rest of the show. You're welcome. All right, so at this point, we'd like to uh, get set up for our next speaker. Uh, who's, uh, we're just gonna switch up over the PowerPoint. I wanna give just a couple of announcements before we go on. Um, a couple of things, we'll have the Q&A at the end and uh, have on the tables papers and pen, pencils so you can write your questions down and be able to uh, ask any questions that you have. And also, during the course of today, there are going to be fraternal assistants throughout the event. So if you want to take part in that, uh, just talk to one of the coordinators, uh, whether that be Bella Ducey, Edison, or Jenny on that. So you want to uh, take advantage of it, please see them. So at this point, I would like to bring up our next speaker, Richard. And Richard, it's so nice to see you. How are you? That's great. How was the trip to Long Island? Uh, I live here, so it wasn't, so it wasn't too far? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. All right, so what I'd like to do is, is we'll get started. I think we got your presentation up here. So can you tell, tell me a little bit about yourself and, and what your background is before we get started? Uh, yeah, actually, that's part of That's my introduction. That's your introduction. So I'm gonna, thank you for making it easy for me. You just take it over then. <laughs> I didn't, mean, I didn't mean to steal your thunder at all. I realize you're playing an MC, he's just doing what he was asked to do, but um, this is part of my introduction, so I figured it, I got it. You're okay? We're good. Oh, we're good, okay, we're good. <laughs> I don't like stepping on toes. Okay, anyway, um, my name is Rich Loria. Whoa, that's hot. Uh, my name is Rich Loria, I'm a professor at Suffolk County Community College. And I wanted to start out with why I'm here. And some of this will explain who I am and what's going on with that. First of all, I was asked. I was asked to be here today. Uh, a former student of mine asked me to speak to you today. And I am not an expert in anything you're talking about today. I apologize for that. No, I'm not an expert in suicide prevention. But this student believes that I have something to contribute to the conversation. And so I'm gonna trust her. She asked me to do it, she knows who I am, she knows what I do, I'm gonna trust her. You can tell her later if she's right. <laughs> okay, I'm not, because I'm not an expert in suicide prevention, um, I'm gonna leave the application of these ideas to you because everybody has different ways to apply what you've learned. So I'm not going to try to pretend that you should do all of these things, and these things are going to get this result. No, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to leave the application of this to it. I believe proves that this works. Some of these ideas, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. So, by way of my background and what I do, I teach ESL, uh, which is also known as ESOL, ELL, ENL, EFL, ABC, 1, 2, 3. <laughs> There are many different terms um, that's used to describe this field. But basically, I teach English, and the ESL stands for English as a Second Language. My students are mostly immigrants. Uh, 10 to 15 percent are international students. And the most common questions I get at a we'll call it a cocktail party or a conference like this, someone that doesn't know me and meeting me for the first time, they want to know, well, where are your students from? And I say, well, <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but no, if they're interested and they ask that question, I try to give them a little more information. I try to say about 50% are from Central and South America. Uh, the other 50% are from pretty much everywhere else. And places that, um, I'm pretty good at geography, but places that I was not comfortable pointing to on a map. Moldova. Yeah. 
Okay, maybe you know where Moldova is. I had, I had a general idea of where it was, but to actually point to it on a map is a whole different story. Uh, Togo, anybody know where Togo is? No? It's right next to Benin. Does that help? No. Yeah, right, exactly. So right, so half of my students from Central and South America, countries that you're very familiar with, whether it's the DR or Mexico or El Salvador or Colombia, or from these other places. We have a very large South Asian population, uh, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan. We have a number of Asian students. When I say Asian, I mean Far East, whether they're Chinese or Korean. Uh, a couple of African students, some Russian, Polish, they're all over the place. Anyway, so where are they from? Everywhere. And then the next question they usually get is, how many languages do you speak? And I say, one. <laughs> I say, one, and they're like, one. <laughs> and they're trying to, after we go through that list of countries, they're trying to figure out which one I speak. Maybe Spanish, maybe French, maybe, po no, English. That's what I speak. I, I know a few expressions, and I, I can, you know, languages, but I speak English. And so then the next question that obviously follows is, well then how do you teach them? <laughs> they don't speak, <laughs> you, don't, you don't speak their language. How do you teach them? Okay. Well, this is, this, is, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Okay. It starts by breaking the ice. You have to break the ice. Now, uh, there are different teachers that have, the di teachers have different ways to connect to the students. And, uh, and introduce themselves to the students. And some professors in, at the college level, especially if there's a lot of students in your class, they really don't show any interest in getting to know their students. Sometimes the classroom can be a pretty cold place. You know, not temperature in terms of a welcoming environment. You come in, you're, you're in a lecture hall with a few other, hundred other students. Everybody's focused on either their book, their notes, or their phone. Maybe the professor. <laughs> uh, but my classrooms are small. I have the benefit of having small classes. I work at the community college. The classes are capped at 40, but my ESL classes are capped at 17. So that helps. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fight that. My classes are capped at 17. And in my experience, it helps if you get to know the students because basically it helps to get your message Uh, and even if they're not, I have to say this, because I was thinking about it, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm so great, I'm such a great teacher, then why do your students fail? Okay, <laughs> let me address that. So even if the students are not successful in my class, I still believe that I have something to teach them. Sometimes it's not about the subject matter, it could be about life, but either way, I feel like that's my job, that's my responsibility. So the first thing you do is you use a little psychology. Okay, everybody needs to take a psychology class, if not three, because it really does help you understand where people are coming from. And if you can understand where people are coming from, that makes it that much easier to talk to them and figure out what they might need in any given situation. So, um, so speaking, of, speaking of this, speaking of breaking the ice, speaking of trying to understand where my students are coming from in an effort to connect with them and communicate with them on a deeper level. This is what my office looks like. Now, I don't know if you can see all of that, but basically when they walk in, they have the flags across the top. There's, uh, there's money, this is all money over here. I have another detailed picture in a second that I'll show you. But basically, when they walk into my office, they see their flag. They see their money. There's a map over here with pins in it, where the students are from. Here's more money in their country. Flag across the top, right? And then here's a close-up of one of my shelves over here. We have Japanese sake. It's empty, don't worry. <laughs> uh, tequila, that is cold. Only in case of not uh, We have a little pyramid from Egypt. This is from Uzbekistan. This is from Bangladesh. This is from Colombia, but it's a Panamanian culture that actually makes these things. Yes. There's a, and that's just one shelf, trust me. My, my office is like a little museum. 
And people come in and they look around. And they're like, What's, where's that from? What's this? What's this? Is that a question? Yes, we got a question. Go for it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry? Brazil. Um, uh, I see a Brazilian flag right here. <laughs> see that? And I do have, I do have hay eyes on there too. That's, the, that's their money. Everybody knows? Okay. It's, it's a Brazilian crowd? Okay, no problem. But yes, I have, I have the flags and the money on the wall. And, and other artifacts, and other artifacts from the country. Okay. So you may be thinking, well that was just a cute way to decorate my office, or a cheap way to decorate my office, right? Just get some World Cup flags and just hang them up. Well, if you are trying to, okay, so hold on, let me go back one second. Remember over here the psychology part? If I'm trying to understand where my students are coming from, well then, if for some reason, if for some reason I had to move to China and live in China, it, it doesn't even matter that it's China. I have nothing good or bad to say about China. It's just the fact that it's a, it's a different country. Or I don't know the language, and I don't know the customs, and I don't know the history, and I don't know what I'm doing, I would be scared. If not scared, at least intimidated. Okay, so I'm gonna be looking for someone that understands me on some level. Maybe it understands me on a language level. Maybe it's someone that understands me on a, a, a personal level. But when you are surrounded by people that are not like you, you're gonna be looking for some sense of comfort. I think that's, that's just basic psychology, right? So my job is I have to welcome them. So I break the ice. If I know where they're from and I know something about their culture, well, then they're reassured because they're being respected. And in addition to respect and knowledge, I think a little empathy goes a long way. So, and, and just to be clear, just to be clear, there's a difference between empathy and sympathy. I'm not, I, I know you all know the difference, because you're smart. We're talking about other people, they don't know. <laughs> but no, empathy, just to, just to be clear, empathy is the ability to understand someone else, what they're going through. Whereas sympathy is a feeling of pity. Those are two very different things. Like, Okay, so sympathy is seeing someone live through a hurricane. And you see the pictures on the news, and you're like, wow, that sucks for them. And But feeling bad about it, but that's bad for them. Empathy is, oh my God, that could happen to me, and how would I feel? So two very different things, empathy and sympathy. Anyway, this is, a, this is a, more of a detail of one of the walls in my office that you saw in the other picture, but you couldn't see the detail. So on the left, you see the money. This is money from different countries, from all over the place. And then over here is just something, well, the beginning of it started with me just using PowerPoint and Google Translate. I typed in the word welcome, and then I hit translate. And, you know, you pull down all the different languages, and you're like, okay, let me get let me print that out in Chinese. Okay, let me print that out in Korean. Okay, let me print that out in Spanish and Portuguese and whatever. And so that's the middle part. That's this middle part here. You can see that this, this was more computer generated. But then it, it, turned into, it turned into something different. Students would see this and then they'd be like, well, you don't have my language there. Okay, great. Hand them a little, hand them a little marker and a little index card. Write it down. Stuck it right to the wall. Okay, so that's my office. That's how I break the ice, right? So all of that helps. All of that helps. And all of that happens before we talk any business. Before, before they come to my office to get advising. They need to pick their classes. Now, 
I told you if for some reason I had to go to China and live in China, I wouldn't even know how to get a haircut, let alone register for classes. Right? You know, God forbid I have to go to the hospital, try to explain myself to someone. Oh, it hurts here, it hurts, you know. So like I said, it's scary, but, uh, so before we do any business, they come into my office, they see their flag, they see their money, they see their culture being represented. Sometimes you can see physically, they're more comfortable. This is before we say, okay, so now, why are you here, how can I help you? Oh, I'm looking to join the college. Oh, I need to take these classes. It's a whole different conversation after we've broken the ice. So a little psychology. The other thing that I want to talk about really quickly is communication techniques. Okay, eye contact. Eye contact. Honestly, it's that simple. You want to listen to somebody, look at them. <laughs> look at them. Make eye contact. People, you know, everybody's got different stories about this, but if you're looking at people, you are connected to them. They say when you're speaking in a situation like this, oh, just look over their heads, no one's gonna know. I'm like, oh, they're gonna know. <laughs> they know if you're looking, you can make eye contact. Proximity, proximity. This is very simple. Now, depending on the subject and the person, or how close you are, it's definitely gonna affect the meaning and the impact that has on someone. Right? This is the reason we're uncomfortable in elevators. Everybody looks up at the numbers. You're standing next to strangers. You don't know them. You don't want to make eye contact with them. Plus, there's a lot of creepy people out there. <laughs> but no, just to demonstrate this, proximity. Me standing up here talking in a microphone. No, 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 sir. This is, this is what I'm trying to demonstrate right now. I'm sorry, this is the second time I'm cutting. <laughs> <laughs> What I want to share is this, standing up here talking to you with a microphone is certainly one type of way to communicate. And if the situation calls for it, then perfect. This is something totally different. Okay. Proximity, and, and then volume also. So, if I want, I can have my big teaching voice. But then when you're sitting down like that, don't close the first thing away. So I didn't put volume up here, but maybe that should be one of the subjects. Uh, obstacles. Obstacles is another thing. Right now, this is a pretty cold way to communicate. It's efficient. It's efficient, but this is not the best way to connect to someone using all this technology. But there could be physical barriers. <laughs> like if you're standing, if you're sitting behind a big desk, and sometimes that's appropriate to be behind a big desk. But other times it's not appropriate. I guess what I'm saying is the more personal the topic, the closer you're gonna be to that person, and the quieter you're going to speak. You don't stand on the street corner yelling out your family's business. Just, just you know, so be aware of proximity, be aware of obstacles that get in the way. And by the way, in this day and age, I would definitely say headphones are an obstacle. A student comes in my office, they have their headphones in. I'm like, hey man, you gotta take those out. They're like, oh no, they're off. I'm listening to you. No, they gotta come out, man. It's an obstacle. If you're listening to some music, you're not paying attention. It's like, on some level, it's like eye contact. You gotta look at people, you gotta listen to people. If you wanna be understood, or if you want them to understand you. Uh, something else that, that needs to be considered here are power dynamics. And what I mean by power dynamics, if, if it's an employee talking to a boss, there is an inherent structure there. There's an inherent power there. So how an employee talks to a boss versus how a boss talks to an employee, that's, I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying that's, that's, that's part of the transaction that's happening, right? A teacher to a student versus a student to the teacher, right? You can apply this to different contexts, the parent to the child, the child to the parent, right? There's all kinds of different dynamics at play, but just understand that 
In many of the situations, regardless of who you are, there's already an established hierarchy. Someone has the power, someone else doesn't. Which also plays into the psychology of the person who's subordinate in that position. Okay, so basically, so connecting these ideas, here's, here's, my, here's my simple summary, basically. Knowledge plus empathy equals respect. Now you can try to give respect, but that's a that's a that's a byproduct. The the, the, the respect is a by, you can that's what you could be aiming for, but you can't actually give respect. Just like you can't actually teach confidence. You can work on things that increase confidence, and you can work on things that build trust and respect. But you, it's hard to work on that directly. So what I'm going to suggest is that you know what you're talking about. You know what you're talking about. This is what I mean by knowledge. And if you don't know what you're talking about, maybe just be willing to learn. I certainly don't claim to know everything. I know where Togo is on a map. It's next to Benin. <laughs> I know a few things. I certainly don't know everything. So if a student comes in with a situation, I have to listen to their situation. I don't know what it's like to be undocumented in this country. I don't know. I'm going to listen to them. Not in a work context, but in a different context. Somebody was talking to me that their nephew was gender fluid. And he's like, I don't even know what that means. I said, well, if you want to talk to that nephew about that, you should find out. Or maybe let him explain it to you. Right? And empathy. Empathy, like I said, empathy goes a long way. Trying to understand where someone's coming from. Maybe try to understand what they might be experiencing and how you might feel if the situation were reversed. And then respect. Like I said, this is a byproduct. This is a byproduct of those other things. But that that person who approached me about the nephew, the gender fluid, if that person went to talk to the nephew and said, hey, tell me about this, without judging them, that would be a whole different conversation and that nephew would feel respected and feel free to talk about it. Right? I did not come here to talk about gender issues, but hey, it comes up. It comes up. And basically all of this leads to respect and will lead to will allow you to connect to the person you're trying to speak with and basically have a greater understanding for each other and you'll be able to communicate on a much more significant level. And then basically that's it. Thank you very much. Short and sweet. I'll let you I'll let take you. over now. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate that kind uh, of courtesy. All right, so let's, uh, we're going to get set up for our next speaker. Uh, let me get back up here. Raquel Murray, I want you to come up. I think are we uh, okay with her, with her presentation on Great. So, Raquel, we talked earlier. You come from a big family, right? Um, just the brother. I mean, your, your little one. Yes, I am a mother of five. I have uh, four children at home right now with my husband. Eight years old, six years old, four years old, two, and one is right here. So yes, I think we're all set up, so why don't we let you go ahead and get started on your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. based on survival, that we all must constantly compete to survive. And maybe, in some ways, this is true. 
But what if they were not the truth? Something that is even more powerful than competition. What if cooperation is our true natural state? Consider this. Love is more powerful than hate. Hope is more powerful than fear. And if we believe in love and hope, then we believe in the power of unity. We believe in the force of positive energy. In fact, cooperation is our true nature. We must work together to survive, to thrive, to grow, to evolve. And with that being said, it takes a village to raise a child. This sentence, well known by a lot of us, is an African proverb. And what does it mean? It takes a village to raise a child. According to the proverb, the meaning of this sentence is a child is a blessing to the, co to the community and therefore the whole community takes part in raising that child, in the education of that child. Back in the villages, this was natural. Nowadays, especially as the world evolves, in the 21st century, we see it developing, and that is beautiful. A lot of technology that help us to evolve and to progress, making our lives a little bit easier. However, um, the sense of cooperation becomes a little bit second-handed. Competition comes now um, up front and what I would like for all of us here today is to think about connection to bring back that idea of those villages that all of us here today are responsible for the ones that comes before us A lot of us here are parents, but also a lot of us here today, in one way or the other, is able to get in touch with a child. And from my experiences as a mother of five, as a mindful educator and coach, where the group that we work together, because, because this is not individual work, it's a community work. We work in the area of mindfulness, how to be here and now fully with kindness and unjudgment. Working with children starting from four years old, through young adults, but also, most importantly, it's working also with the parents, the caregivers, the educators, and everyone involving, and everyone involved in raising a child. Therefore, from our experiences, I, we came up with 
three very beneficial concepts for child upbringing. The first one uh, summarizes what it takes a village to raise a child, which is individuals and community. The second concept is experiences and situations. And the third concept is one that I believe it's one of the most important ones, is emotional intelligence. And I would like to break it down by each concept to give you a little bit of an example of what, what they mean. The first concept is individuals and community support. What is that? So nice to see Richard coming up here and talking about him being a, com a professor and an advisor. I remember growing up as an ESL student. I failed so many classes in high school. Many, many. It took me longer to finish, but I remember one advisor that believed in me. And he did everything in his power, especially he looked at me in the eyes. And he said, Raquel, you can do this. And I looked at him and I thought by myself, what is he talking about? There's no way I can do it. But he helped me and he was part of that village. And therefore, I would like to share just some examples. Besides our parents, right? our brothers and sisters, even our pets, our extended families, grandparents, uncles and aunts, cousins, our caregivers, babysitters, nannies, nurses, individuals like all of you here today, the teens, what a beautiful lecture you did, Via, thank you and your brother right there. The schools and educators, Richard, again, thank you. I head off to you. Community health centers, how important they are. Such as recreational centers. Those recreational centers give children the opportunity to be free and to grow and to run and to experience the sports to experience your passions. Maybe your passion is not in academia, but maybe it's playing a sport, or maybe just being near people and working with people. Hospitals, how important hospitals are. Angelita, you working in a hospital and soon become an Ayurvedic doctor, how important that is. Ayurvedic medicine changed the life of my child that couldn't sleep for two years and now he's sleeping peacefully and sound. So congratulations on that. Healthcare clinics, also so important. Counseling, how important it's to be able to have a place that you can go and you can talk about your feelings and your emotions. But also a spiritual and religious institution, how important they are. If you're a spiritist, how important it is for you, parents, or even a family member to take a child to evangelization, those classes where they learn about something greater than themselves, that they are a DNA of God, and how beautiful that is, how powerful that is. Have you thought about us and even our inner child, that we have the DNA of God? We are God with little G's, capable of so much. Whoever's not spiritists, together with a mission, a mission of spiritual growth. Lastly, nonprofit organizations. What a blessing they are. All of them registered on their a particular state and even the non-registered ones they lift up the children from inside out they give them hope they give them food they give them peace of mind
but most importantly, the push them to become the best they can be, to grow to their full potentials. The second concept that we came um, up with, it's experiences and situations. So now we have individuals in the community that's able to embrace the child, but also within that, there's experiences and situations that are very, very important, and they are the building blocks of a child. The first one is nature. Look at this beautiful background. Can we feel like nature as it is? Let's take one moment just to appreciate the beautiful plants and the energy it brings to us. Gratitude for that. When a child is able to experience nature, the child is not only able to describe what nature is, the child is able to feel nature. The most beautiful artists, they're not the ones that copy on the piece of paper exactly what they see, but it's, there's something beyond in that. They transfer that feeling, that existence of that particular piece of nature onto the paper, and that becomes beauty and art. And with that being said, positive reads are another very important experiences for children, such as spiritual books, the gospel, books that talk about spirituality, emotions, the arts also are very important for a child. Nothing like playing music, Fred, what a beautiful gift he has to play the violin. It uplift, uh, uplifts us from inside out. Entertainment, positive entertainment. Be able to laugh. Jim, thank you. So nice to hear that, you know, like a, a joke, a nice joke. It just uplifts you from inside as well. Now I would like to talk about mindfulness practices how important it is and because this is my passion and something that I love can we be fully here today can we are we able to even hear our heart beating or maybe visualize our heart beating for one moment. Can I have the moment of silence for 10 seconds? Can you, make, can you please close your eyes? How are your hearts beating? Is it fast? Slow? What is your heart trying to tell you? You may open your eyes. And that's one very small <coughs> practice that you can do to come back to the present moment. How are you feeling right now? And the second situation is that I think it's very important for a child to thrive is charitable work. How can we share the experiences of the world in a very positive way and yet show the children how the world is? through charitable work, going on missions. If you cannot go far, you can do it in your neighborhood. Your child will grow with empathy. Richard, did I say it correctly? Yes. <laughs> and, and that is beautiful because the child is gonna put herself in the same situation as somebody else and gonna say, wow, Look at this, what can I do to help? But more than that, that person is just like me. So ch charitable uh, services are so important for the upbringing of a child. And the third concept 
that I think is very important is emotional intelligence. Why is it important, emotional intelligence? Everybody talks now in the 21st century about emotional intelligence. I didn't really know much about it before 2015, I did not. And one thing that I realized by facilitating mindfulness practices for the children, but especially for the parents, caregivers and educators, is that they say, I cannot get out of my head. My head keeps thinking. This feeling does not go away. This emotions are driving me crazy. What can I do? And there's a lot of techniques that you can practice. The first one and for most, if I can leave a message, is that you are beyond your name and form. The emotions, thoughts, and feelings are not you. You are an immortal spirit, much greater than that. You are divine, a, a, a particle of light. So, like Eckhart Tolle said, if you're not your mind, then who are you? You know you're something greater than that. So if all these emotions come, are you able to separate yourself from those emotions and thoughts and feelings? Because if you're able to do that, then life becomes a little bit easier. And the reason why is because then you're able to understand what's going on, understand what triggers those particular emotions. So I ask you this question, how are you really feeling right now? I am going to answer that because I have the microphone. <coughs> I feel nervous, <laughs> I'm very shaky, I don't speak in public that much, and public speaking was always very difficult to me. I cannot believe I'm here in front of you. My hands are very cold. However, with all of that happening inside of me, I know they are not me. I'm just feeling those things. But on top of that all, I'm having a great time. So how can you feel all that and still have a good time? Because the more you get to know yourself, the more you're able to, even though going through very difficult moments or stressful moments in your life, you're able to continue living gracefully and still smile. So once you get to know yourself, you understand what triggers your emotions. And once you understand what triggers your emotions, then you are able to grow within that space. Viktor Frankl, the writer of Men Searching for Meaning, he's a psychiatrist and he um, had experiences in the Holocaust. He was one of the um, prisoners taken to um, the, the camps, he said that between stimuluses and, and response, there is a space. In that space lies your growth and your freedom. So, going back with the emotions, if you feel fear or anger, let's say anger, you either can just react angrily back or you can use that gap that he says to take a deep breath, know that that anger is coming to tell you something. Allow that anger to pass and then you respond. And that gap lies your growth and your freedom. So therefore, I believe that emotional intelligence allow all of us to be able to be more connected. Because we not only understand about ourselves and what's going on inside of us, but we also start to have compassion. And then also we understand that the feelings that the others are feeling, 
are just feelings and emotions. It's not who they really are. So when there, a child is having aggression, instead of us reacting, oh, come on, stop being aggressive, or stop feeling sad, we give them the space to process that aggression and that sadness and understand that's part of human growth. And that's why we believe that emotional intelligence is important. Therefore, we invite you all to join us on this journey, to choose to see life through the eyes of love, to choose joy and hope, to truly illuminate the light shining brightly within us. Embrace peace and love and unity. We are right here for you. We believe in the power of unity. It takes a village to raise a child. And we are that village. Thank you, Lucy. so needed nowadays. So thank you all for putting it all together and behind the scenes. Everyone, I would like to say a special thank you to my friends this week that supported me with this lecture, Adilson, Angelita, and Melissa, my mother, and everybody, because it takes a village to be here in front of all of you. This is not only my work. Thank you all. Thank you, Rocco. Really, really wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> really great. So we're going to uh, take a little stage management break and set up some chairs. We're going to have a bit of a panel discussion uh, before we take a break. So I'd like to invite uh, folks that are going to be a part of that panel discussion on up. So if you'd come up and take a seat, that would be great. Uh, right there. Uh, Richard, if you would, please. And Laura.
And we were lucky that it was not a party line. It was a dedicated phone. Now we have all of these other methods to communicate where it also allows for the opportunity to miscommunicate. And I think we miscommunicate more than we, we communicate, period. But what are some of the things that um, that you see? Now, all, and all of you, I would like to have your commentary on this. What are some of the challenges that you see today as far as you know, young people and dealing with this topic? I guess that means I start. Okay. Um, well, I teach, yeah. obviously, so I'm, I'm familiar with the students and their technology and their use of technology. And many of them live through the phone. And they, honestly, they don't have to be, they don't have to be students. Uh, I have a 14 year old at home, not my girlfriend's daughter, but uh, she lives through that phone. That is her experience. And what I find fascinating is the fact that she doesn't compare herself to the other people in her class. Sometimes she does, sometimes she does. The people she knows at school, in her class. But now she's comparing herself to somebody that has an Instagram account, or a YouTuber, that their portrayal of their life is only part of the equation. But young people today who are growing up with this technology believe that their life sucks compared to this person who's only represented the, the most perfect things about their life. So there, there's that competition that, that didn't exist when, when I was growing up. I wasn't comparing myself to people who were very rich or very famous or all of that. You were comparing yourself to people that you had more proximity to. And it, it, had, it was different, it was different. So, so I see this, that the fact that students can, students, children, anyone really, anyone really, but really it affects younger people more because they don't realize that that's only half the story. Your friend, those people on Instagram are only sharing the most, the, the coolest aspects of their life. They're not sharing everything else. And so that gives them this sense that their life is terrible compared to all these other people. That, that, can, be, that can be devastating to some students. So children, anyway, because <laughs> it's a competition on some level. Well, I have an 18 year old at home and we live with a disabled child. She, he has a disabled sister. So in our home, there are many challenges. We live in a moment in humanity that we all experience challenges all the time. Teenagers, adults, me, you, it's difficult. I grew up, like Jim said, when we only had one TV, a video cassette, if we were lucky, rich probably, and I had to raise two children in a completely different environment that I was raised. With a disabled child who can speak, 16 year old, who can speak who is mentally disabled. How do we do this? Thomas came to Spiritism. He was eight years old. When he was nine years old, he told me one day, Mom, does that mean that when we see Bella in the spiritual world, she's going to speak? It made sense to me. Because what took me probably over 10 years to understand what was happening to my child, it took him one year of understanding that this life goes beyond this body. And the experiences and challenges that we live in this life are only temporary and necessary. To raise my adult, almost an adult, 18 years old, adult, there was only one way. I had to make a connection to him in the deepest form. I only had 
a few years and Julian's now in college. Life um, already asked him to be the best in everything, to be rich, to be successful, to be the best musician, YouTuber, basketball player, whatever, because we are raised to be successful. If he found in myself another one, make him or, or ask him to be the number one when he is probably feeling like he's not going to be the number one, we wouldn't find connection. So I'm, I'm not a strict parent, but, but I expect the best from him, but the best he can give. My way to help my son and my daughter in her special ways is to make sure that he understands he has potential to be the best he can be. Not the best what I think he should be, a lawyer or a doctor or he has the potential inside of him to be his best. In order to open this conversation and really find space for me to have that conversation is to go in his world. One example of this was a couple weeks ago, he came home from college to spend the weekend with me. Our dog has just passed and we were, you know, going through grief. And he told me about a box fight that there's two very famous YouTubers. This, do you guys know about this? Because I had no idea. Very famous YouTubers, one from the UK and one from the US, were going to fight each other to see who is the best. They are both like very famous, over 10 million followers each one. So I had to go into his world watch something that I don't appreciate and I don't even agree with any type of physical fight. But that opened a channel, a channel of communication with him and me. The next day, the first thing I did when I opened my eyes, I went on one of the YouTubers' channels and I watched the, the press conference to see what the winner said. And there I was inside his world. And we had a great breakfast talking about boxing. I am one of their followers now because I, <laughs> the UK guy, because I needed to understand why he's watching. We say our children leave in their, and you that have five, that our children leave in their phones and that we don't know what they're looking. I was yesterday with a family with a 10 year old. We spent most of the time that I was there using TikTok. I don't have TikTok, but that's what little children use. You have TikTok, William, right? We need to go into their, their world. If you, if I pose myself as a perfect, a saint, someone that in my teenage never done anything wrong because I did so many things wrong. When is my son gonna come to me and say, mom, there were um, kids smoking pot next to my door. If I tell him that God forbid, he will never have the freedom or the willingness to talk with me about what they're doing. How is he gonna come to me and tell about his sexual orientation if he's having 
questions. How is he gonna talk about with me about difficulties that he's facing in his college life if there is no connection? How is he gonna talk about depression, not feeling worth it if there's no connection with me or with his father or with whoever? So my take on this is what both of you presented like so well. Connection is so important, but not with our children, but not putting ourselves as better than them because we're not. Just so we're just a little older. We may, we have tons of experience that we hope they make better choices, but they have to make their choices. And in order to do that, I hope that when he makes a bad choice and he falls, that he knows the door is open to come and talk to me and tell me everything about it. Uh, I actually would like your, your opinion on that as well, Raquel. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a tough, it's a very difficult subject. Well, I remember on my graduation night that uh, one of the speakers said that there's too many raw data in the world. With that being said, it's too many ideas, too many creations, where there's not enough um, digestion of those data. Therefore, um, I think the challenges that we are having today, um, I think the children, the youth, and the parents, is are we taking the time to process those data? Because they come so fast to us. And because it comes fast and we don't process it, we don't understand it, we don't feel it, we don't categorize it, we don't give the, the value that it needs to be given, then, we go to the next and next and the next and the next one. And somehow um, we get pleasure out of seeing different things. Because if we're not able to digest one data, to process the data to the root of it, then that feeling that we naturally have of understanding and going deep into details of a particular um, data, we get not satisfied. So we want new ideas always to come, I feel, you know? So um, I would say just take time, take time to be on social media, go on YouTube, no problem, but process that first. Don't overwhelm yourself with so many ideas without really thinking about them. And another thing, I, I'm sorry if I, I couldn't really express myself in this topic, because it's very difficult, but one thing I would say too is that perception and reality are two different things, and that brings back to what Richard said. You know, I tell my child, my children, um, the oldest especially, I say, Oh, mommy, um, you are happy because you're smiling. I say, honey, I'm smiling because I am here and I am happy, but do you really know what's going on inside of me? So when you see a lot of people smiling, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not feeling any pain. So I think it's very important for all of us to know that the reality is much deeper than what we can see or sense with our five senses. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. One thing interesting about social media, like my son said the other day, and I don't know if you guys are going to connect with that, he said, Mom, social media confuses me because I see my, I see my friends, they post things like we are doing a lot, but I do a lot but somehow I feel like I don't do enough and that confuses me. 
Interesting, interesting. I, uh, I'd like to go back to Raquel, actually, because there was a couple things that you mentioned in your uh, presentation, Raquel. Uh, the emotion, emotional intelligence, uh, processing their aggression, how do you really make that happen? How do you, how do you distinguish between, uh, and I'm talking about the 13, 14 year old range, uh, of a child who just wants to go mm -hmm. do their own thing, be by themselves, but at the same time, is there a problem there that you don't know about? I'm speaking from my own experience, my daughter, uh, 13, 14, very, very social. She always has been very social. So there was never a concern. She never was to have to go into her room brooding. What's the difference between being moody, brooding? Is that an indicator that there's a problem there? Where, where is that line, do you think? You know, I am not a therapist nor a doctor. Right. However, from my experiences with working with youth, in my own personal experience, I believe that first of all, uh, she's a female and she's 13. So hormones plays a huge role into teenagers, especially girls, right? Um, they're getting to know this themselves in a much deeper level. They are going through the teenage years and then soon to be a um, young adult. Uh, but I would say that I think the most important thing is to allow a teen to experience solitude for a little bit. And as a parent and educator, if you're really in contact with yourself, and I, I highly recommend for parents to do a lot of meditation as well, because meditation somehow you're going to be attuned to the universe and you're going to be able to find the right answer to whatever is happening because we all different individuals we all have different personalities and we all have a mission on the earth but there are moments where we feel joy when we feel sad when we feel even depressed and that's okay I would say after two weeks, if you see that after two weeks, uh, I say it because of myself, I just went, came out of a, a sad state, but please don't be sad for me, it's okay. <laughs> um, where I learned a lot about myself. And after the two weeks passed, I, you know, something wanted me to continue to be, I said, uh uh, wait a minute, you came, I welcomed you, I analyze what you're trying to tell me. Now, let's go. Let's make it happen. So as a parent, it's very hard for us to tell a child that. But at least with a lot of communication, trying to go into their own world, try to welcome whatever they're feeling through different ways, then you are able then to uh, start to have that connection and that openness with the child. A lot of dialogue. But I think um, going back, getting to know your feelings as a parent. How am I feeling today? Because once you understand your own feelings, then your child is gonna, without you knowing, know that you also are trying to understand what you're going through. Because when I feel angry, I feel angry. And it comes out. And I say, God, I'm so sorry. I'm showing that to my child, but then I go back and I say, listen, I'm sorry, mom is also learning. And I understand that I have, I had two options, either to use my anger in a positive way as a educational growth, or use my anger as a destruction. And I used, I even went the second way, the second route, and I use it as a destruction. Therefore, there are consequences. So when you also process that inside of you, not only inside but outside and out loud by sharing that to your child, then your child naturally will do the same. So I think it starts also with the parent and always checking on them. I don't know if I was able to. Yeah, totally. Anybody else have any comment on that? Please. Okay, so I spoke about welcoming students, and so in a parent-child context, that's clearly, you're not welcoming them anymore. They're already a part of your family. But back to the 14-year-old who's gonna be on the phone. Uh, so I have, friend, I have a number of friends that are not married and don't have 
children, so sometimes they ask me, so what's that like living with a teenager? And sometimes I say, it's like living with a bad roommate. <laughs> they don't clean their room, they don't clean up after themselves, they're gonna eat your food. So on some level, it's like a bad roommate. And I, and I say that jokingly, but there's a lot of aspects that are true there. But I, I'm making a joke. But the, the reality is that they are not adults yet. We have a separate category. They're, yeah, you can say young adult, but they're not developed yet. They're half-baked on some level. They're a moving target. Whatever they believe this week is not what they're gonna believe maybe next week, maybe next year, maybe in three years. And so the, the challenge to the parents is to be patient enough to let the child explore that knowing that that's not a life decision yet. It could become one, but that's okay. So Violetta was a vegetarian for six months, and she was one of those annoying vegetarians <laughs> where you would sit there, be ready to cut into a piece of chicken or take a bite of something, and she'd look at you and go, you're a murderer. <laughs> Take a breath before you respond. That it makes the it makes a world of difference. So, you know you were a murderer for the first twelve years of your life. You know that. And so sometimes, sometimes you want to fight back, and sometimes you want to encounter the sarcasm with your own sarcasm. And you can play that game, but ultimately it's up to you to be more patient than than them. They are not an adult yet. They haven't learned all the skills you have. They haven't made the mistakes that you have and learned from those mistakes. They have to do that. So anyway, yes, you could be you could be funny, but but then guess what? Six months later, she's not a vegetarian anymore. So she's like, she comes home from school. I've decided I'm not a vegetarian anymore. That's, that's fine. What do you want to do? She's like, go get a hamburger. I'm like, of course you do. So he took her out, got her a hamburger with bacon and cheese, and just uh, she went. Up, you, you know, she went for it. She ate that hamburger like someone that hasn't had one in six months. And she was super happy. At that point, I didn't tell her she was a murderer, okay? <laughs> I let her enjoy that experience. It was probably the next day or two days later when I saw her eating meat that I returned the favor. Right before she was about to bite into that chicken, I said, you know you're a murderer. So basically, I'm saying, have patience, breathe before you respond. They are gonna change what they believe this year. It's not what they're gonna believe next year. So just one more quick story about Violetta. She comes home the other day, so she's lazy. But I'm not being mean, I'm just being realistic. She's lazy, so fine. She comes home, she just joined high school. Oh no, it was last year when she was in eighth grade. She comes home, she's like, I'm joining the volleyball team. That's great. Why is she doing it? Because her friends are doing it. That's fine, totally fine. After volleyball came, I don't even know what other sport she was doing. She was doing track for a little while, and then, okay, fine, that was eighth grade. Ninth grade, she comes home the other day, she's like, I joined the fencing team. I have never, ever heard her express any interest whatsoever in fencing, sword fighting, martial nothing. I have no idea if she's gonna do it next year or not. I'm sure that there was a friend that pushed her in that direction, and guess what? Again, as parents, be patient. They're changing, they're growing, their pain's not easy. Breathe, have your own coping mechanisms, you know, and, and telling them for the hundredth time to pick their clothes up off the floor. If it didn't work the other 99 times, the hundredth time isn't gonna work. So you're only stressing yourself out by yelling at them again. I mean, if you want to, if you want to keep, hey, you're not getting your phone. Give me that phone until you clean that room. Fine, play that game. Play that game because they want the phone. <laughs> so hold it over them. No, but if you want a certain response, you and okay, make it a, make it a this for that quid pro quo. Hey, you want the phone? Hey, 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 you gotta do that. Maybe you have an allowance system. I don't know, but just remember, they're changing, they're growing, they're going to make mistakes. It's part of the process. You made your mistakes, right? We have the scars to prove it. You know, that's how I, you know, 
be patient, breathe, it helps. Yeah, oh my gosh, well, you know, I, I, it's so funny because, I mean, I work on Wall Street and have for many, many years now, for what, almost 25 years now since I lived in New York, and it is nothing compared to being a parent. Being a parent is the hardest thing, and you have all of these challenges put forth, you know, you, and, and the, the, you pick up your clothes for the 100th time, um, and, and trying to figure out, okay, is my child safe? Is, is you know, what, what they have to deal with is not only going to school, is some uh, lunatic gonna come in with a with an AR-42 or whatever they call them to shoot, shoot everybody up? Dealing with that, dealing with the peer pressure that they have on Facebook, or no, they don't do Facebook anymore, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, it's all about Instagram, I think, and Twitter now for, for the young ones, I don't know what am I But um, I, it's just, you know, that, that fine line of where, where you know, what you can do for them. But I think that, uh, you know, the bottom line is when my daughter was born, I'm a gay man, and I never thought that I would have a child. And by a certain set of circumstances, <laughs> um, it, actually, it actually did happen. And I, I remember when Marina was born, I thought, it just, it was such an overwhelming feeling. I never knew that I could love a, another human being as much as I love that child. And, you know, that I try, even though we have our trials and tribulations, I still try to think of that, uh, and we do. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that I also is very curious to me, and again, none of us are psychologists, right? None of us are, right? None of us are, right? I certainly am not. My degree's in music, so again, what do I know about that? But from, you know, experience, why is it that, that there's so much education out there that people can take part of, so much uh, attention to teen suicide and that? Why is it still happening? Why is it still increasing? That part is the part that I don't understand. Anybody have any words of wisdom on that one? It's, I, I think it's really all about communication, yeah? Well, no, I think it's part of the, the period that we are all living. I mean, suicide is happening at, it's increasing in all ages and the challenges that we are living as humanity is part of the transition that our planet is going through and it's part of shape, shedding the old and making room for the new generation. We are seeing so many new spirits like coming with new ideas, these kids sitting right here in front of us, they are so much more ready for, as spirits, like they are just like, the, the babies are born almost speaking now. So the new generation is coming while the ones that are still um, attached to old habits, are no there's no longer space for them so we are going to this transition where we when we go to like deep cleaning our house and we have to separate what we don't want to what we want to keep it's confusing so i think this is the new world that the next generations, we are already seeing. We just saw the other day, the girl from Sweden. I mean, we see kids doing things, we see teenagers, we see like, this is the new generation. It's a generation that's gonna bring a much better world to all of us. And I think this is just part of this moment of transition and it is confusing and sometimes it's hard and we are seeing suicide among elderly like old people we are seeing suicide in kids like 10 12 years old and how come there's something inside of us that is going through a very very deep state of confusion and I think in this specific case, the spiritism has so much to offer 
and has so much to explain and has so much to give us the sense that everything we go through is necessary and temporary. And when you deal with your challenges, when you face your challenges this way, things just make sense. And it's easy because you know everything is going to pass. Everything is going to be fine. It's just a big wave. And sometimes we go through many storms. But after each storm, there is sunshine. And sometimes a storm lasts a lifetime. But sometimes it only lasts, you know, a couple of weeks. And it passes. And I think it's just that sense of instant gratification that we want everything right now. It's hard there for some of them to not get it right now. But I think, like I said, the Spirit has helped me, has helped my son understand why, or, why his sister is disabled in one year, learning just a little bit about life. This is not just this. Life is not just this, it's temporary. So there, there definitely is hope for the future. We just have to hang on. We older, or me older ones. Yeah, right. Yeah, I just want to add that I feel, um, you know, there's uh, an existential emptiness. And now it's an invitation for all of us to come back to ourselves, first of all, as well, to get to know ourselves. Know that we are beyond our name and form. That um, love sustains us all. That nature is very important, our environment. The people in front of us are very important because they are real. So come back. Well, I wouldn't say come back because we cannot go backwards, but remind ourselves that the material um, gains are temporary. They are there to serve as a tool to help society as a whole. So when we become more connected, when we become more um, given, then this emptiness starts to feel, you know, you can feel we start to become fulfilled. And then you start to see life in a more uh, beautiful and uh, grandiose way. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. But um, so, so then that emptiness is no longer there. So love, do charitable services, um, know that happiness is not your successes, it's not your titles, it's not the roles that you're having now, right? Because now I'm, I'm a mother, now I am married, I have five children, and I have a new puppy as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but all of that, right? I have a house, blah, 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 blah. But how about when I lose that title as a mother? Not I lose, but it's already comes to an end. How about when I no longer have the house that I live in? How about if, for whatever reason, my, my husband goes back to the spiritual world and I find myself by myself, then what? Then am I the mother only? The wife only? The one who owns the house? No, I'm much bigger than that. So we have to just remind ourselves that everything that we have are tools for our spiritual growth and they're all educational opportunities. There we go. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you for participating in this out. That's very good. Okay, okay you got it. Um, um, now, guess what? We're going to take a break. We're going to take 30 minutes, right? 30 minutes? 20 minutes. Uh, yeah. 20 minutes. Okay? Um, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, maybe, so. Maybe it feels me. Uh, four, <laughs> Shall we, shall we say 4 o'clock? Okay, 4 o'clock.